Okay, everyone, good morning. Um, I see there's about uh, 60 plus uh, attendees already logged in. Um, my name is Ashnik Rivan. I'm the Senior Staff Specialist in the Te Technology Advancement Office. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the Voucher Incentive Program training workshop uh, for all dealers and dismantlers. Um, uh, before we get started on the workshop, I wanna go over some uh, reminders and go over some ho housekeeping details. Um, first and foremost, um, please make sure uh, you at least opened or, or have the handouts that was emailed to you. Um, I also emailed all of you copies of the slides so you can follow along. Um, if you don't have it or if you need it after the workshop, I'd be happy to provide it to you, but you should have copies of them, of them if you're on this workshop because we sent the confirmation email along with the attachments on the email. Um, and the handouts we'll be referring to during the workshop as well, so please uh, have them nearby. Uh, we'll bring them up on the slide as well, but it, they will be key uh, useful references for you and when submitting applications as well. Um, one other reminder is uh, please make sure that you've logged in through Zoom with the same email address that you registered. I know there are some of you that had to change email addresses and some of you are at uh, remote locations away from your usual uh, place of doing your operation and you may all be in one room uh, representing or on behalf of the for the workshop. So. Um, if that is the case where there's like, you know, five or six of you or however um, in the same room and you're all just watching one screen, that's totally fine. Just have whoever the main person is send an email saying, hey, these individuals were with me in the same room we attended the workshop. Uh, please include them as uh, completing the workshop. Um, aside from that, I'm gonna go over just some uh, formal housekeeping uh, remarks that uh, we would like to present and then we'll get started. Um, so here we go. Good morning. Thank you for participating in our remote meeting for the VIP dealers and dismantlers training workshop. We will do our best to facilitate a smooth meeting with the public, with public part participation and ask for your cooperation and patience. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom, except for South Coast AQMD staff, will be placed on mute by the host. That means you will not be able to mute or unmute your lines manually. For those on Zoom, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment on the Zoom screen, please click on the raise hand button. This will signal to the host that you will you would like to ask a question and you will be asked to, you will be added to the list. If you're using Zoom on your smartphone, please tap the raise hand button on the bottom of the screen. For those calling in using the phone line only, you can dial star nine on your keypad to signal that you would like to comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line automatically. Um, we also ask and expect all participants to adhere to the normal guidelines for public decorum, specifically treat others with courtesy, civil, civility, and respect. Profanity, profanity, discriminatory comments, and obscene gestures are prohibited. If you, could not, if you cannot abide by these guidelines, you will be removed from the meeting at the panelist's discretion. Disorderly, unruly, or aggressive behavior that infringes upon the rights of others or disrupts the good working order of our meeting is also prohibited. Any violation of the above rules can result in your mic being muted, your video feed shut off, or you being dropped from the phone or Zoom meeting lines. Okay, so welcome to the workshop. Uh, as I said, I'm Ash Nikravan, um, and uh, I oversee the voucher incentive program. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, some of our teammates here as well listening in. Uh, we have uh, Eugene Tan, the program supervisor in our group. And I believe Cynthia Snyder is listening in. As you, many of you know, she's the, uh, she's the backbone for our administrative part of the VIP. She helps with all the getting the application, sending out all the stuff. And so um, she really helps us out tremendously on, on that aspect of the program as well. Um, this is an, a workshop, so I definitely want to encourage you to participate. If you have a question, um, you know, feel free to raise your hand. There is no bad time or bad, you know, uh, you know, th there are no dumb questions as we all all say. So feel free to raise your hand when you need to say something. Um, let's see here. I believe we already have a question, or let's see here. Bear with me here. Uh, 
Okay, never mind. Disregard. Okay, so let's get started. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide, Anthony. Okay, so this is the agenda for our workshop today. Um, we're gonna have uh, introductions and program overview and progress, overview and progress. Uh, there's gonna be the dealer's requirements and training followed by the dismantler requirements and training. And, and we'll conclude with questions and comments. Uh, there's a lot of details and slides that we're gonna go through. So bear with me. Um, and it is key details that I wanna make sure everybody understands, especially if you're a new dealer or dismantler participating, this is, uh, one of the first requirements that is required to be completed before we can accept you as a participating dealer or dismantler. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so program overview. The goal of this program is to reduce emissions from in-use heavy duty trucks and small fleets by replacing older vehicles with new models that are cleaner than the 0.2 NOx emission standard. As everyone knows, uh, the California Air Resources Board uh, developed a NOx standard back in 2010, where it says all um, diesel emission, diesel vehicles need to, heavy duty diesel vehicles need to be certified at 0 0.20 grams per brake horsepower hour or, uh, for NOx or cleaner. So the goal of this program is to fund projects that are above and beyond that standard by creating what we call is surplus emission reductions. And so uh, we can approve projects that are going above and beyond that standard. Um, in terms of outreach, uh, CARB and South Coast AQMD will continue to assist with providing info, brochures, workshops, and uh, assistance. However, the dealers and dismantlers are also expected to inform customers about VIP and provide accurate information about the program. Um, we, dealers and dismantlers play a very cr critical role in the VIP program, uh, including but not limited to assisting applicants with completing their applications, achieving program goals, maintaining program integrity, and ensuring a correct and consistent message. Um, I, every year when I hold this workshop, I, I, I always tell people, you know, VIP may stand for voucher and center program, but it also stands for very important partnership. Uh, because without the dealers and dismantlers, um, this program, you know, would not do as well. And your, your involvement and, and being, you know, the first line of contact with the interested applicants that come to you are very critical. So we want to make sure we're giving out the consistent message. Um, uh, you know, less, we don't want to find or let this turn into the telephone game where one info changes 12 times before it gets to the applicant. So we wanna make sure we're consistent uh, with our information. And if there's any questions, always feel free to reach out to me to, to get clarification. Um, I saw a hand up earlier. Is, do you still have a question or was that just accidental? If, if, if you still have a question, please raise your hand again. No? Okay, we'll continue. Oh, okay. Um, Joe, Joseph Vital. Uh, Anthony, could you please open his line? Ash, thanks for uh, taking my uh, call. So sure. uh, just, just real quickly on uh, the goals, it says um, uh, in small fleets, what constitutes a small fleet? That's and, a good and, question. Um, I, it's actually coming up on the next slide, but but no oh, problem. Okay. I'd be happy to answer that. Um, a small fleet under the VIPs is, is considered any fleet that has 10 or fewer diesel fueled vehicles with a GVWR of 14,001 pounds or greater. So basically, you just ask the applicant what's their total fleet size that are diesel fueled. And, and as long as they have one that's a truck that's 14,001 pounds on the GVWR, not, not the weight on the uh, registration, but the actual manufacturer gro gross vehicular weight rating, um, that counts as part of their fleet. So if they have 10 or fewer, they're eligible. Perfect, thank you. No problem. Thank you for your question. Um, next slide, please. Okay. It was a good segue, Joseph. Now we can answer that question. So the voucher incentive program, it is limited to owners and operators with fleets of 10 or fewer vehicles. Um, they do have to operate at least 75% of their operation in California. Um, 
doesn't mean it has to be in Southern California, but it has to be 75% of their miles has to be statewide. Um, it is a first come first serve basis. So unlike our other incentive programs where we have open solicitations and everybody applies during the solicitation period, and then everybody gets evaluated at the same time and the project gets ranked. Uh, first come first serve as the name implies, if you apply before someone else, regardless of how much more attractive the next applicant's project may be, uh, if you meet the eligibility criteria, you, you will be funded because you applied first and if there's still funding available. Um, fleets must be in compliance with the truck and bus regulation. And I'll uh, get into that later in a future slide with more details. Um, and the, the, the projects that are eligible under the VIP program for this year under the 2022 VIP program are replacement projects for any fleet that has a GVWR greater than or equal to 14,001 pounds, a small fleet, of course. And the replacement options for them are um, natural gas, where they can get up to $160,000 per truck, certified at 0.02 NOx or cleaner. Or if they want to pursue zero emission technologies, they can get up to 410,000 per truck for zero emission technologies. Uh, drayage and non drayage trucks with engine model years 2007 to 2009 are eligible. And the existing truck can be diesel or alternative fuel. So if they have an older, like 2008 or 2009 truck that's LNG or CNG, they, 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 they can still apply and get funding. Next slide, please. Okay. So there's been some, um, I'd like to call it big picture changes for this year's program, which is very different or, you know, I, I think they stand out compared to the past uh, previous 12 years that we've been running the program. So uh, this year for the first time, replacement trucks must be alternative fuel. Uh, diesel replacements are no longer an eligible option in our region. Reason being is diesel trucks, the, the 2010 standard, basically the, there are no diesel truck engine technologies yet that have been developed that are cleaner than the current standard of 0.2. So what that means, like I mentioned earlier, is we have to fund projects that generate surplus emissions, meaning going above and beyond. Unfortunately, diesel technology at this point is only at the 0.2 level, meaning that there's no delta there. There's no surplus emission reductions being created. Therefore, um, because of the truck and bus regulations and, and, and the deadlines are coming, uh, we cannot fund diesel in our region. Now, when you look at the funding tables, which are part of the VIP guidelines that we sent you, uh, there's a section that references tables that mention point two, but that's for uh, regions that are considered NOx exempt and South Coast is not a NOx exempt region. Uh, there are some very scarce lo locations in Northern California and um, we actually inquired uh, with CARB as to exactly how does that happen. And they told us that the applicants that are, that are claiming to be in NOx exempt regions would have to reach out to the truckers hotline and get guidance from them on how to declare that. And they would be required to stay in that region or operate exclusively in that region to qualify for that option. But basically um, the whole point of the, uh, that explanation is it's not eligible down here. So uh, replacement trucks must be alternative fuel. Also this year, I know previously we allowed uh, replacement trucks to be new or used, but, but due to the fact that uh, the replacement trucks must be alternative fuel technologies, and there is yet to be a, a considerable inner inventory of used natural gas trucks, or let alone um, zero emission trucks, because they're, they're you know slowly being developed or, or commercialized at this point. Um, there isn't a used replacement truck option this year. Um, so the applicant must purchase a new replacement truck. Uh, that being said, there is significantly higher funding amounts available as uh, on, like previous years, as, as many of you know, the max use used to be around 60,000. And in the past uh, three or four years, it was even less significantly lower. But now due to the new cost effectiveness limits that have been developed and, and adopted by CARB, um, you can get up to 160,000 for a natural gas replacement truck and up to 410,000 for a zero emission truck. Um, the replacement truck, uh, also an, another big change is, you know, you, VIP usually requires you to deliver the replacement truck by December 31st of each calendar year. 
Now, considering with everything that's happened for the past 24 plus months and the, the manufacturer delay, all the domino effect that has caused a lot of delays in every aspect, um, there is a manufacturer delay compliance extension option. So when you apply or when the applicant applies, they can, the, they can pursue that option. And I'll go into more details about that in later slides. And I actu actually sent you an email. In the email that I sent, there's a handout that also dis describes it in detail from CARB. But basically, if they apply this year, and it's absolutely crucial, when I get to it, I'll talk about it more, but keep September 1st in, in your mind because that's the absolute deadline that they can place a purchase order to qualify for this extension. So between now and September 1st, applicants would have to apply for the VIP and place their purchase order with you uh, and so that we they can qualify for applying for this extension and take delivery of the replacement truck in 2023. And uh, also that they'll be able to operate their existing truck um, until they get delivery of the new. They don't have to scrap the old truck by December 31st. That's another huge uh, improvement to the program. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, some, some historical progress for the program. Uh, for the past 12 years that the VIP's uh, been going, we've funded over, or we've replaced over 1,300 trucks uh, with funding from various sources that were allocated to the program, totaling over $45 million. Um, next slide. Okay, so what is the general uh, process flowchart for those who prefer flowchart? So the applicant would visit your dealership, either call you or show up, and the dealer would go over the eligibility requirements and prepares the application. Once you gather the application or prepare the application, uh, conduct the pre-inspection, and gather all the uh, paperwork that's required, support, uh, you know, the supporting documentation, the dealer you, uh, would submit the application to South Coast AQMD. And we have 15 business days to evaluate the project and respond whether it's approved or rejected. Um, I usually try to respond to the dealers within those 15 days if there's something quick that can be fixed because there's no point in rejecting projects if we can fix it within those 15 days and get the approval instead of having to reject it and ask you to resubmit all over again. It's not a good use of anyone's time. So um, we do have 15 business days to evaluate. And then once it's approved, we send out the notification and the reimbursement package to the VIP dealer. Uh, and once the replacement truck arrives, the dealer submits the completed reimbursement package to South Coast AQMD. And then we have another 15 business days to process that, that package and pay the, pay the invoice. And the old truck uh, must be delivered to the dismantler by the dealer. So uh, when you're ready to deliver the new truck, the, the applicant under this program must uh, take their old truck to you and surrender it to you. They can't take it to the dismantler themselves. It's the dealer's responsibility to take the truck and, and, take, and coordinate with the dismantler to drop it off or, or have them pick it up but the applicant cannot be involved in that process, um, which is very different from our other incentive program. So I wanna make sure that's clear. Um, applicant will take delivery of the new truck from the VIP dealer and the dismantler has 60 days from the date that they get the old truck from you to, de to destroy it. And um, applicant's only responsibility after driving off with the new truck is fill out an annual usage report that we send them on an annual basis for three years. And it just asks them, what's, what's your odometer reading? What percentage of these miles has been in California? And they fill it out, sign it, and send it back to us. And that's pretty much the gist of their responsibility for, for those three years. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I see some questions. Um, let's see here. Can we see? OK. Anthony, are you able to see? Yeah, you want to me uh, unmute the uh, podcast? Sure, Tony. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, Tony. Tony, did you have a question? I see your raise your hands raised. 
Okay. I guess not. Okay. Is there anybody else with a raised hand? Okay. Luis has a question. All right. Luis, go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me, Ash? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Ash. Thank you for taking my uh, question. Sure. Um, just to make sure and uh, be clear, uh, customers that they wanted to uh, uh, change their truck that is uh, diesel, mm -hmm. uh, they are the uh, NY10 uh, or, or newer, mm -hmm. they don't qualify for the program, only for alternative fuels like electric or gas? Well, um, when you say model year, are you saying engine model year or truck yeah. model year? It's an engine model year. They have, okay, let's say that they have 2008, nine or 10 vehicle they need to change. The program only allow, uh, for example, we are a dealer for a used trucks. Right. We can sell only used trucks, but for what I understood, uh, we cannot, they cannot um, change their truck with a regular diesel truck. It has to be alternative fuel. Correct. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, diesel replacement is no longer an option. Um, okay. So yeah, they would have to get alternative fuel if it's a 2009 engine and uh, basically 2007 to 2009 engine model year, which means it could be possibly a 2010 truck with an 09 engine because usually the engine's a year older than the truck year. Um, okay. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah. In, in other words, uh, we don't have uh, trucks for this kind of clients, unless we have the electric or the gas, basically will be a new trucks. For this year, yeah. And it's a very um, unique scenario this year, especially with the limited time we have of the five months, for, well, less than five months between now and September 1st. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that we, we double checked that with CAR because I said, so you're saying use are not an option. They said not for this year's. They are actually today, they have a meeting at 4 p.m. at CARB. Uh, it's a public meeting that they're gonna discuss considerations for the next year's program because obviously 2009 and older won't work for next year. So they're gonna consider new engine model years and what options they're gonna offer. Um, but for this year, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not gonna be, a re used replacement won't be a viable option. Thank you, sir. Thank you sure. very much. No problem. Any other questions? All right, Adam. Hi, Adam. Hi, um, quick question also on that same slide five. Uh, it says that the replacement truck must be delivered in 2023, that's next year. If our OEM can produce an electric vehicle this year still, can we deliver that same truck this year or do we have to wait to take, uh, or does the customer have to wait until it takes delivery next year? Okay, no, that's a very good question. Um, and I, It was breaking up, but I think I heard the, 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 the gist of the question. You're saying, do we have to wait till 2023 to take delivery? Okay. Yeah, we have to wait till 2023. No, no, absolutely not. That's just an added flexibility. Obviously, the sooner you can deliver it, the better. And um, but we don't want to uh, limit you or limit uh, the dealer's options because uh, of uh, the the forecast that we've received from the various manufacturers saying, you know, if you order now, we can't deliver uh, till you know middle of 2023. So. We want you to know that that's, an, that's, that's okay. That's allowed under the VIP program so long as the applicant pursues these steps that I'm going to go over and they adhere to the September 1st deadline. So yeah, you can deliver this year. Short answer. So. Any other questions? No. Oh, okay. Joseph, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Joe. I think you're still muted on your end. Um, or do we need to unmute? Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, um, AQMD has 15 days to uh, release funding after the inspection of the new truck. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that funding, uh, is, uh, does the customer, do we have the option of either sending the funding directly to the dealership 
the customer or their bank? No, we, we the check is always issued to the dealer. Okay, the, no. good to clarify. Yeah. Thank you, Ash. Sure, no problem, good question. Any other questions? No, okay, let's move on then. I don't see any hands. Or, or is there more, Anthony? I'm sorry, I thought I saw no more. No more. No. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna go over the general eligibility, eligibility criteria to be a dealer. Uh, you must have had a valid California business license for the minimum of the last two years. In addition, you have to have had a valid vehicle dealership license with DMV for a minimum of the previous two years. Uh, you must maintain a minimum of one employee that has been trained by the South Coast AKMD on the terms, conditions, and requirements of the VIP, which by attending this workshop, having at least one employee at your dealership um, per location. You can't have one employee at multiple locations. So if you have multiple locations, you need to have one uh, employee for each location. You can't expect them to be at two places. Last time I checked, you can't be at two places at once, even with Zoom. Um, so, and also agree to allow South Coast AQMD or CARB to inspect vehicles or audit the program records during normal business hours. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and then uh, some of the general eligibility criteria for dismantlers. Uh, you must be a DMV licensed dismantler for the last two years, along with having a valid business license for the past two years. And um, dismantlers are required to have a valid California Environmental Protection Agency hazardous materials generators permit. That's a mouthful, but you have to have one of the, I'm sure, you know, to be a dismantler, you have to have that, but we need to see that you have a valid uh, uh, generators permit. And that's something we'd, you'd have to provide as part of the documentation before we start initiating the contract with you. And like the dealerships, you have to have one trained employee at each location, and you must comply with all local, state, and federal laws and like regulations. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was just a general overview. Now we're gonna get into the, um, the details and meat and bones of the dealer requirements and uh, provide uh, you know, all the element requirements and uh, feel free to raise your hand as we go along. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is expected of the dealers? Dealers must become familiar with all the program requirements. Um, I, we don't expect you to be experts uh, or memorize the guidelines, but at least have a general understanding of the requirements and per, so that you can provide accurate program information to the applicants. Uh, again, you guys, uh, dealers play a very important role in this program as do dismantlers. So we wanna make sure we're providing accurate information um, so that the applicants feel confident about what they're you know, pursuing. Uh, you must assist the applicants in completing the applications correctly and accurately. And uh, you must perform the vehicle inspections and ensure requirements are satisfied. Next slide, please. Okay, some additional expectations. Uh, dealers must contract with South Coast AQMD to participate in the VIP. Uh, there is a sample contract language in the VIP guidelines if you, you're interested. Uh, you must sum submit complete applications to us. Uh, incomplete applications will be rejected and returned to the applicant. And I'll go over that in details uh, when we do an example later. Uh, you must provide accurate and complete documentation. Uh, for example, you have to show the voucher amount, basically the, the amount, the grant amount that they're approved for being deducted from the purchase price of the vehicle on the purchase invoice. That's critical because um, the applicant is not responsible for that portion upfront. They're, you know, you're deducting that from the total purchase price that you agreed upon. You also wanna ensure that all the requirements for the old vehicle and replacement vehicle have been satisfied. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, other important uh, responsibilities. Um, you must provide guidance on supporting documentation. Uh, for example, uh, verification of usage. A lot of the applicants, I know these are small fleets, uh, so they may not have the most detailed uh, record keeping. You know, sometimes they come to you with a shoebox of receipts or paperwork and say, make this work. So uh, 
for example, for, for mileage, you know, when we ask for the past 24 months usage, we're not asking for daily usage. Uh, we just need like a quarterly basis of uh, an odometer reading that you would find, whether it's their own uh, trip logs or if it's a bid inspection or maintenance records, which would clearly identify the, the vehicle with a license plate or a VIN along with the odometer reading because we take the odometer reading from two years ago, subtract it from the odometer reading from a year ago, and that's the mileage for year one. And uh, the odometer reading from a year ago and the current odometer reading to see what the mileage was for this year. And we have to, the, the guidelines require that we fund the voucher based on the lower of the two 12 month periods. Um, and so it's critical that you make sure that the usage records that the applicant is providing you, first of all, is, is legible and, and the details are on there. Um, and so that we can perform the calculations that we need to verify the mileage. Um, certification of small fleet, the guidance on that, again, I explained earlier what qualifies as a small fleet. They have to have 10 or fewer vehicles. Um, they, if they have like multiple CA numbers, uh, I want to make sure that, you know, sometimes, you know, they say, well, I have three trucks under this one and, and, and 12 trucks on the other. So on my three, no, if you have multiple CA numbers, which you usually shouldn't have, but if you do for whatever reasons, um, your total fleet size uh, needs to be 10 or fewer. And that's one of the checks that we sent to the California Air Resources Board during that 15 day evaluation period for them to check. Are they truly a small fleet or if not, then we, we can't uh, proceed with the application. Um, so you wanna make sure again, to discourage submittal of inaccurate or fraudulent information uh, in the past 12 years, we've had very few cases that were questionable. And when we looked into it, we got clarification and it was resolved, but just make sure that the applicants are standing by what they're submitting. And more importantly, remember that you're submitting this on behalf of your dealership and the contract that we executed with you. You're saying, I'm, you know, this, this is the accurate information that was provided to me. And we're representing the district, the, the dealership that you know we're submitting this out paperwork on. So we want to make sure it's accurate and and, and has the accurate information and reliable. Um, you want to ensure that the old truck has not been stripped of value. Like you know they can't say, oh, I'm going to take the tires off and I you know I really like uh, the transmission, so I'm going to swap it out. No, it has to be the same way you saw it when they came for the initial inspection. And you also want to make sure you're transferring the full value of the of the voucher to the to the customer so um, whatever price you quote at the initial point and when they get the voucher um, you know we want to make sure that we're giving them full value of the voucher uh, at the point that they're taking delivery um, next slide please okay so um the VIP funding tables, um, I, in my experience, even as someone who's been doing, doing working on it since day one in 2009, the tables have gotten more and more confusing and there's a lot of choices. And I always wonder like, you know, how do, how do, how would an applicant or how would a dealer figure out? So I, I, I made some steps for you guys that I think will help in deciding, first of all, uh, how to figure out which table applies to your applicant and, and how to, decipher which table to use when they come to you to apply. So first thing you wanna do is determine the GVWR for the existing truck. That'll tell you if it's a light heavy duty, medium heavy duty, or heavy heavy duty based on their GVWR. Um, and then you wanna determine if the applicant is drayage or non-drayage because there, that is a distinction for this year's funding tables. And you would use the corresponding table based on their scenario. And I'm going to go over some table uh, table examples after this slide, so stay tuned. Um, and then you want to determine if they want to purchase a near zero natural gas truck or a zero emission replacement truck, because uh, there are separate tables for that. And then um, also you want to find out which compliance path they're choosing, because um, by now, because of the truck and bus regulation reaching its endpoint by the end of this year, um, most fl fleets, if not all, that are going to apply are going to be following the engine model year schedule. What does that mean? It means that they're basically following the deadline that a certain engine model year has to be scrapped by, by a deadline. Um, so one of the handouts I sent you in the email, it says truck and bus uh, regulation compliance summary. 
And you want to make sure you take a look at that because that actually you can show that to every applicant that comes in and they say, okay, well, why can't I apply if I have a 2005 or a 2003? And you could show that handout to them and say, look, the truck and bus regulation required that this has to be off the road as of this date. And based on that requirement, uh, the only engine mile years that are left for this year to apply would be 2007 to 2009 engine model year. Keep in mind that's engine model year. So if they have a 2010 with an 09, that would be fine. It's not the truck year. Um, also, you wanna calculate the mileage for the past two 12 month periods. How would you do that? Let's say they're applying this month, April, 2022. So you would look at the mileage records from April, 2020 to April, 2021. That would be year one, the first 12 month period. Then from April, 2021, all the way to April, 2022. And again, we look at the two annual mileages for those two years and decide based on whichever is lower, use that as determining what the voucher amount is. Next slide, please. Okay, perfect. So this is an example of one of the funding tables. And as I mentioned, first thing you do is find out what's, what's the GVWR of your truck. So um, this one is gonna be a heavy, heavy duty example. Any truck with a GVWR of 33,001 pounds or greater is classified by CARB as heavy, heavy duty as, as you guys, as you know. And then this applicant is a drayage truck, meaning they service the ports and they're pursuing a low NOx natural gas replacement truck. So uh, this is the table that would apply to them in terms of funding option. And as you can see, there's several bullets um, below the table too. It says no truck and bus regulatory compliance dead before January 1st, 2023. Um, replacement vehicle must be put, uh, delivered or post inspected by December 31st or later if granted a de manufacturer delay compliance under the truck and bus regulation. And they must show trucker's documentation. Trucker's doc documentation, I'll go into further, but basically every fleet that you deal with that's gonna apply for VIP, even if they're a drayage truck at this point, um, I mean, they can submit their drayage truck re registration for compliance, but they will need to apply to be in truckers uh, before September 1st as well. And I'll get into that further. But, um, and the funding eligible for this, as you can see, if they're doing 50,000 miles a year, they qualify for the 160 maximum. Obviously, if they have lower miles, they'll get the lower funding amount, but it's not an all or nothing, which is a good thing because basically, let's say they're doing, you know, 48,000. It doesn't mean they don't qualify. They, the 48,000 would get them $140,000. Um, I saw a question, a uh, hand raised, uh, I think it was Lacey. Uh, do you still have a question or Anthony, can you bring that, bring her up if she still has a question? Oh, no, no hands up right now. No hands, okay. All right, thank you. Um, any questions on this table? Um, I have more tables that I'm gonna go over, but I just, okay. Ismari, uh, raise your hand, go ahead. I just wanna clarify something else. You said if the person has 48,000 miles, yeah. Uh, if funding up to 140 in the past, it was lesser than that. So it would have been 47, 47,000 miles to be, to have 140. I'm sorry, you, 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 it's very muffled. I can barely hear you. Oh, you sorry. In the past, you, you, would, you would have to round down uh, uh, to get to your next mission for the funding. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you say it, say it one more time? Now you're on mute. I am muted. Okay. There you go. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah. In the okay. past, something in the past. That's all I heard. Sorry. sorry. Okay. So you said if someone had 40,000 40, miles, that they would still qualify to get the 140. Based on this table. Yeah. In this specific scenario. Correct. Oh, okay, because in the past, we have round it down. So they would have to get the 47. No, I mean, if they have 48, uh, that was just a random example, but I mean, 48,000 oh, okay. uh, based on this table would qualify you for 140 because the minimum you need to get 140 would be 47. But if they're at 48, that's right in between, you know, the next level and, and the previous level, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? 
Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for your question. All right. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. So let's see. Okay. Uh, wait. Can we go back? Wait. Did we go two forwards or go back to the previous one? Sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry, Let's, um, we can go to the next slide, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is another example of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, okay, I was trying to figure out what's the difference between, see, I even get confused sometimes. The previous example was for a drage truck that wants to get natural gas. This example is for a non-drage. Basically, they don't go to the ports. So um, same scenario, you know, uh, they have a truck, uh, their old truck is a GVWR 33,000 pounds or higher, 33,001 pounds or higher, and they're pursuing a 0.02 NOx replacement natural gas truck. So here, similarly, uh, they can get up to 160,000 if they're doing 50,000 miles or more. And if the mileage is lower, then they would get the corresponding value depending on how much they qualify for. So as you can see, usage records is critical in, as part of determining how much they qualify for. But the good part for this program versus the other solicitation programs that we have, it's uh, very black and white. It's, there's no ambiguity of how much they qualify for. If the mileage is at a certain level, the table shows you exactly how much you qualify for. So there's no surprise. Um, now, sometimes they think their mileage based on how that they calculated is a certain amount or they took the average or something. We don't do averages. We take the, the lower of the two calculated odometer, you know, the annual usage for the past two 12 month periods. Meaning that, you know, it's gonna be from, you know, the past 12 months and then the past 24 months. And we take the lower of the two. So sometimes they think, oh, you know, one year was higher than the other. Why am I getting the lower? Well, it's because we have to pick the lower of the two. They're thinking of changing that hopefully for next year's program, but for this year's, we have to stick with that uh, requirement. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now this example is for a, a zero emission replacement truck, including drayage. So um, again, they have a heavy, heavy duty truck. So it's 2007 to 2009 engine model year. And, you know, they can get with 49,000 miles a year on the old truck that has been documented, they can get 410,000 towards the replacement zero emission uh, truck. Any questions on this? No? Okay, next slide. Okay, and then I think this is the last table example. Um, this one I just wanted to show you for the lighter heavy duty or medium heavy duty. They both are on the same table, so it's a little easier. And this applicant is non drayage and they want to get nat natural gas replacement. So they can get 120,000 with 42,000 miles a year. And obviously, if it's less, then they'll get the lower corresponding amount. Next slide, please. Okay. So what's required or what qualifies for the old uh, old vehicle, which, you know, basically the existing truck they're coming in to turn in to be scrapped. The engine must be 2009 or older. Uh, for this year, again, because of the truck and bus regulation, it'll have to be 2000. Mm -hmm. Paul? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So the... Engine must be 2009 or older. And again, because of truck and bus regulation, it has to be 2007 to 2009, most likely. Um, the existing engine can be diesel or alternative fuel. And the weight class has to be 14,001 pounds or greater. The applicant must have owned the truck for the previous 24 months. Uh, and the title must show the owner or the applicant listed as a, as a sole owner. This is very critical because um, under the VIP, if the truck, instead of having an individual name, if it has a company name, we need additional documentation such as the California Secretary of State Statement of Information document. It's a form that whenever someone files as a corporation or LLC, is a form they fill out saying who, 
who the actual you know, owner is or owners. So if that document clearly shows that the individual is the president or CEO with no other owners listed, that will satisfy the proof that we need that the applicant is the sole owner. Obviously, if the title just shows the individual's name, we don't need that document because it clearly shows that they're the sole owner with their name being on it. However, if they have a you know, business name showing, then we would need that documentation. Also, the title cannot have any active lien holders. So ownership means they've paid it off and they've owned it for the past two years from the time that they're applying. Um, you also need to have, make sure they have had continuous California registration for the previous 24 months. Now, um, there is an alternate approach uh, for, you know, if the, if the applicant says, hey, I register month to month, but I didn't keep the past 24 months, you know, I, I only have the last eight months or, you know, you, you can go to the DMV and get something called the DMV transaction history, which shows the last eight transactions. And it, if they're month to month, you'd see the last eight months. So if they don't have the previous 24 months, they can still apply by providing that document along with their current registration, but they would also need to provide proof that they've operated the truck in California for the previous 24 months. So how do you prove that? You prove that with uh, showing uh, delivery receipts or bills of lading, showing that the truck operated uh, at least once per month for the previous 24 months. So I would need basically a, do a document showing that the truck was in operation for, for for once every month for the past 24 months. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? And that's only if you don't have 24 months of registration. If you have that, we don't need that. So. This is only a, an alternative approach for people that didn't keep all their registration uh, documents. A lot of the truckers are good with keeping their registration because you know they want to keep track for their own purposes as well. But there is this alternative approach to help uh, applicants that didn't keep the last uh, 24 months. Um, additionally, they need to provide proof of insurance show, showing continuous history over the previous 24 months. Um, those, that's a lot easier because usually history or sorry, insurance is usually an annual basis is not month to month from our experience or at least uh, semi-annually. So it's a lot easier for them to keep tabs of those records. Next slide, please. Okay. All right, so some additional requirements uh, for the old vehicle um, noted here. The, 20, the old truck must have uh, operated at least 75% of its miles in each 12 month period in California. Um, again, how do we verify that? Well, if they're California only registration, then that automatically is self-explanatory because they're in California, so we don't need to do anything to verify. However, if they are IFTA records and they're a fleet of one, uh, we could look at their IFTA records showing the percent of miles in California versus the other states. And as long as that's 75% or more in California, then it should be fine. Keep in mind though, like I said, that IFTA option only works if you're a fleet of one because IFTA records are a summation of the total fleet, not just for one truck. And we don't have the option of like saying, oh, they own three trucks, so we'll take the total and divide it by three. Unfortunately, that's not allowed. So. Um, unless they have a way where they itemize their mileage through a reporting service, that's like a third party that certifies their usage before they submit the total through the IFTA reporting, that would be an option, but um, it would have to be you know, certified and verified before we can accept that if it's a fleet of greater than one for using IFTA records. Um, also, the old truck must be in operational con condition that's where uh, dealers come in. You, you, you're going to conduct a pre-inspection. Basically, you know, they come to your dealership for the appointment for the signing the paperwork for the application, and you would conduct the inspection. Please make sure you are conducting the inspection. You're signing on there that you know you state under penalty of perjury that you've conducted the inspection. You've taken the required photos, and uh, you'll be submitting that as part of your application when you submit the application package. Um, the engine specs must be verifiable through the tag. The engine tag. So if the tag is missing, then uh, you can provide the manufacturer spec sheet. However, that's only if the engine serial number is still available or, or it's been stamped on the engine because we need something 
to cross-reference the specs that's being provided from the manufacturer. And it can't be just, we don't have any info and we're just gonna give you the specs from the manufacturer because we need something that is linked to that. Um, glider kits are acceptable on the old vehicle if it has a glider kit, but not on the new. Um, if approved for the voucher, but this, uh, subsequently the old vehicle goes under accident, you know, gets total, catches on fire, it may still be eligible as long as the pre-inspection was done by the dealer. Uh, this has never happened, but I just, it is an available uh, thing if it happens, but only if the pre-inspection was already conducted by the dealer. And the participant must deliver the old vehicle to the dealer in the same condition as well as, as when it was pre-inspected. So, like I said, if they're towing in the old truck to you the day that they're, you know, coming to take delivery of the new truck, that's a red flag. Do not accept it. It has to be driven in, you know, see if it matches how the truck was when you first met with them and did the pre-inspection. Otherwise, you have to reject it if it's not road roadworthy. Um, I believe there was a question by Joe. So, if you still have it, uh, Paul, would you mind uh, unmuting his line? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, probably not your area, Ash, but uh, as far as um, different engine manufacturers, uh, uh, should we assume that the engine tags are all in the same place or they would, would they be at a different location? And do you have a, 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 a guide as to uh, where we could, uh, you know, find the engine tags per manufacturer, Detroit, Cummins, et cetera? Yeah, that's a very good question. Usually, um, I mean, you're right. They're not all, like, the, there's no standard, uh, you know, industry requirement of where it is. But in my experience, uh, the driver, the applicant will know exactly where the engine tag is. If they don't, uh, you can reach out to us and we can help you. But I know in the brands that we've usually seen, you know, um, Peterbilt, uh, Freightliner, uh, Mac and Volvo and Kenworth, they're all, the, the challenging one, I, I, and again, I'm not picking on the brand, but the international one, the, the tag is a little unique because it's a little bit like some details are on the top, then it, you gotta look all the way to the bottom to find it, but it's there. And then I know on the medium heavy duty side, the he knows the serial number is a very tricky place to find. And you almost have to put the truck on a lift to find the engine serial number because it's not anywhere where the engine tag is. But if you have any concerns or issues that you encounter, um, feel free to reach out to me. Our inspectors have inspected those trucks, many of them, so they know exactly where to locate them. They're usually somewhere on the engine, um, but the details uh, of where each element is, like the engine serial number, the engine model, the engine family number, they're all different parts of the label. And it's just a matter of looking at it and, and taking several photos to identify it. And you're more than welcome to send me some photos as an example of one that you looked at and I can help you find what location for each element exists, where, where to find each of them. Great, thank you, Ash. No problem. Um, I don't see any other questions. So let's move on to the next slide, please, Paul. Okay, so all right, we talked about earlier that you part of the application submittal process is that the applicant has to demonstrate compliance with CARB's truck and bus regulation um, or the DTR if they're a drage truck. Um, so if they're registered in truckers, which is an acronym stand that CARB has developed, it's a reporting database where uh, you know uh, on-road fleets report in there. It stands for truck upload, truck reporting upload and compliance reporting system in case anybody gets asked that on Jeopardy. Um, but basically it's just uh, where the fleets go in and uh, upload their fleet info, you know, the VINs for all their trucks, the, the make and model year and what compliance path they're in, they're pursuing. Um, and so when you submit your VIP application on behalf of the applicant, they need to provide you that document. And it's a four, four item uh, process. There's four sections that when the applicant logs into the trucker's database that they need to print out. There's one called the compliance status, the vehicle info, the company info, and the certificate. So we need all four of those elements uh, printed out 
and the date that it's printed out must match the date that they're signing the application. So please make sure um, when they come in to see you and, and to fill out the application, and sign the application date, that they're going online with you and, and printing that out. Uh, obviously they need to log in and put in their info. Uh, I would highly recommend have them do that themselves because it's their own login, it's private information, but have them print that out with you so that they can provide that to you the date that the application was signed. So it's consistent because it has to be on that date or, or newer. It can't be like a printout from like three months ago um, because we needed to show that it's currently in compliance. Um, and if you're a drage truck, you wouldn't need to submit the trucker's compliance certificate because you're under the drage truck regulation. So all you would need to do is print out the DTR com, uh, compliance certificate, which is a one pager that you can print and submit. Um, I, I see a couple raised hands for this uh, slide. So Paul, if you don't mind, when you have a moment. All right, Todd. We'll Go ahead, Todd. You. Todd, you may talk. Very good, thank you. I'm finding most guys do not report on truckers. So they look at me like I'm speaking another language. They've never heard of it. Really? It's another alternative to truckers that they are required to do or that is acceptable. Are most of these guys drayage trucks? No, there's guys that are not drayage. They don't do truckers. Okay. That's very surprising because they're they one or two trucks in their fleet. They're small. They look at me. I don't, they, they've never heard of it. Okay. So I know uh, for the lighter heavy duty side or medium heavy duty side, they had the option of not reporting, but yeah. that's if their GVWR is, I believe, 26,000 pounds or lower. Are, are these the lighter heavy duty? Or yeah, usually lighter. Yeah, okay. 26 and under. Okay. So the 26 and under, they weren't required to report. But in order to apply for this program, we need them to go in and report. So um, if they need help finding out where it is, or if you, you know, I can, okay. I can, I can send that to you and, and you could have them report. It's not like they're going to be penalized for not doing that, but okay. we need that as a proof because when we send all the information to the California Air Resources Board, after they apply, they look up their trucker's ID and says, okay, what's their compliance status? Can they apply or not? Otherwise, there's nothing for them to cross-reference and check their compliance status. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Good question, Don. Um, and now Joseph. Okay. All right, Joe, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm asking so many questions, but um, I'm okay. working with a lot of uh, drayage truckers and um, when you can, if not uh, move up in, in a little bit, I'll need the uh, website for truckers so I can share that with them. And if they're not registered, they can apply right away. Yeah. And just so you understand, um, they don't need to be in truckers if they're a dray truck right now. However, uh, by September 1st, if they're going to apply for that extension for the delivery, they also need to go into truckers and register there as well, because come January 1st, 2023, all drayage trucks uh, are going to be um, going under the, the truck and bus regulation anyways because of the way the rule was written. So they will be uh, required to be in the trucker's database at that point anyways. So they don't need to be in there right now when they apply, but it's critical that they do that before September 1st. And I'd be happy to send you the link for that. Please do so. Okay. No Thank problem. you. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Sure. No, I'll send it. Um, yeah, you can actually, I mean, I'll send it, but just so you know, you can just go to Google and type in truckers database okay. and it'll show up, but I'll still send you guys the link. So thank you very much. No problem. All right. uh, I don't see any more hands, Paul, or is that it? Lacey Robertson. Okay. Hi, Lacey. Yeah. Hey, Ash. Um, thanks for taking my question. So sure. uh, regarding uh, the drayage, uh, you know, operators having to register in truckers, is that only if they're getting the manufacturer delay extension and then, or is there an additional requirement for all drayage to be registered in truckers after September 1st period? Or how does that work? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I don't have the answer to that. I just know the instructions that CARB sent us for the our incentive program, both for um, 
VIP and for Carl Moyer that if they want to apply for this extension, they need to have a trucker's account because that's where they'll update the compliance that it's saying. Um, there's some language in there. I think I have it in the upcoming slide, but basically to qualify for that compliance extension, um, they need to have an account so that they can go in there and, and tag it as, as, com as ex uh, com you know, the compliance extension has been uh, issued or, or granted by CARB. So I don't okay, know. But if, you're you're not aware of any other requirement that would set that says that that if they're not, let's say someone's not trying to get the compliance extension and they're just operating drainage, that they have to be registered in truckers, right? Uh, I'm not sure of that, and I don't. Want, what I would recommend is asking CARB because we've asked them because come January first, all those trucks will automatically be subject to truck and bus regulations. So. I would presume they'll do something to transfer them or oh, ask them. So new, so anything that's newer than 20, that has an engine model year 2010 and newer will have will be subject to truck and bus. What what, do, what does that mean after January well, 1st? Well, because January 1st, 2023, the, the truck and bus regulation, everyone that's an existing drayage truck will be under the truck and bus regulation come January 1st, 2023. So, but again, that's only, that would, I'm guessing that would apply only to 2009 and older because. Right, because that's, that's you know. So I guess it would regular. matter at that point. I, you know, that's a good point because it's like, they're not gonna extend the rule. So I don't know if they're gonna transfer everybody or if it's a, a, a moot point at that point. Okay, so, okay. You know. All right. Thank you. Sure. Are we good on questions? Paul? I think we are, Ash. All right, we can continue. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. Great, thank you. Yes, please. Okay, so now we're gonna shift focus on what the new vehicle requirements are. Um, it must be purchased from a South Coast AQMB approved participating dealership. Um, and again, because of this year's uh, unique scenario, the engine model year would have to be 2022 or newer with an engine certified to a level of 0.02 gram per brake horsepower hour NOx or cleaner. Now, um, a lot of questions uh, that people are asking is, well, what if we're gonna deliver in 20, late 2023 and the engine that we want hasn't been certified yet because it's still in development? That's totally fine. You could still apply and put in the 2022 equivalent and just put a note in the application that at the time of delivery, applicant will be pursuing the 2023 equivalent. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, also, uh, we talked to CARB about this. Electric vehicle conversions are not eligible for VIP per CARB. We, if you are thinking of converting or con you know, your vehicle conversions are not an eligible option under VIP, you must buy it from the OEM and to be eligible. So wanted to clarify that. Uh, you must be registered by, or you, the replacement truck must be registered uh, by California DMV in the same weight class as the old vehicle. So basically apples for apples. Um, if the old truck was medium heavy duty, the replacement truck must be medium heavy duty or you know, vice versa. What, what, there's no uh, upgrading the, the GVWR. There are certain unique scenarios that are allowed, but generally you need to stay in the same weight class. Uh, the vehicle title must be clean. Uh, this is not going to be an issue now because the replacement truck must be new, but this was an element that was important if you're buying a used one. And also you have to provide a minimum of one year, 100,000 mile major component engine warranty covering parts and labor. Um, the replacement truck must be delivered in California, so no out-of-state deliveries, and there can be no modifications of the emission control system. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Paul. Um, so, okay. Um, we were talking about the manufacturer delay compliance extension. Again, this is an option that the applicant can pursue after they've applied for VIP. 
And uh, this is a very time sensitive element. So, so I wanna encourage your applicants if they wanna pursue it, you wanna make sure they apply now and they don't wait till August 31st to think about it because the deadline is September 1st. But applicants that are approved for a, a VIP voucher can apply if their replacement truck will not be delivered till 2023. Um, they must have a trucker's account. Uh, and that's and again, um, Lacey, as you asked earlier, the fleets under DTR must create a trucker's account as well. And this is only if they're applying for this extension uh, under, under the VIP. Um, applicants must have a fully executed purchase agreement for the replacement vehicle before or on September 1st, 2022. Now, there are very specific elements that CARB has highlighted as to what constitutes a, a purchase agreement. So. Um, these are the, the detailed elements that needs to be in there, so I'm going to go over it. Um, the purchase agreements must have the following elements. It must identify that a specific compliant vehicle and specific engine was purchased. So you want to make sure when in the description in your purchase agreement, it shows the vehicle and the engine and, and specify that if it's a 0.02 NOx, low NOx uh, replacement or zero emission. Uh, also specify the date of purchase, and it has to say must be for immediate delivery. Um, I asked CARB myself, uh, just out of curiosity, why does it have to say immediate delivery when it's the manufacturer delay? But I guess they want to say that the intent is for immediate delivery. However, um, we realize that immediate might not be, as the, as the word implies, as, as immediate as we intend. Um, it, it does, CARB also want to highlight that letters of intent or other agreements that are not binding or are contingent upon other decisions that remain unresolved as of September 1st are not sufficient to qualify for the extension under the truck and bus regulation notice regarding the manufacturer delay compliance extent option. So it can't be just a purchase order that they walk in on August 31st and say, can you just print this out? I'm gonna sign it and submit it. No, it has to show that you know they've ordered it. You guys have a, a, a purchase agreement that's binding. And um, they also need to show, let's see, I'll, let's go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, um, they also need to show that they've put a monetary deposit as well. So um, this way it'll ensure that the applicant is committed and they're not gonna just apply and then back out. Um, there is a, let me, let me talk about the rest of the requirements and then I'm gonna reference a document that was emailed to you as well. Um, upon taking delivery of the replacement truck, applicants must update their trucker's account within 30 days of replacing the replacement truck or engine with the replacement vehicle or engine information. Report the date of the, when the baseline vehicle was submitted for scrappage into the trucker's account to demonstrate com continuing compliance with the truck and bus regulation requirement and the funding will be contingent upon applicant continuing to demonstrate compliance upon delivery of the replacement vehicle. What does that mean? That means that you wanna make sure that you don't have any other vehicles in your fleet that received a citation or have compliance issues until you're waiting to take delivery. If there's issues, you will need to make sure that's resolved before we can fund the truck at the time of delivery. Um, On-road projects that have been approved for a VIP voucher and approved for the manufacturer delay compliance extension under the truck and bus regulation may continue to temporarily operate their baseline vehicles or engines until they receive their replacement vehicle funded by the program, even if it is after the initial compliance date of the baseline vehicle. What does that mean in simpler terms? Basically, you're not required to scrap your old truck that is 2007 to 2009 engine by December 31st of this year. Once you've been granted this extension, you can continue operating your truck until you take delivery of the new truck in 2023. Um, I saw a hand raised, um, so I'd be happy to answer that now. Okay. So we have two, uh, Bang Yong Lo and mm -hmm. Joseph Atal. Okay, uh, let's start with Mr. Lo. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Lowe. Ash, can you hear me or? Yes, yes, okay. thank you, good morning. Right. Um, I wanna say on the question I had was on slide 22, um, mm -hmm. yeah, page 22, you, you, the first uh, bullet point that says, 
a uh, new vehicle needs to be purchased from a South Coast AQMD approved participating participating dealership. Is there an application process for the dealers? Yes. Um, in order to basically, in order to be an approved dealer, you have to first complete this training, and then you would submit paperwork to us proving that you meet the eligibility requirements that I mentioned in the earlier slides, showing you know uh, that you're located in California and you have the DMV dealer's license and a business license and all the other requirements I noted earlier. Once we get that, we would initiate a contract with you, which takes about you know, two to three months to execute. And once that's executed, you become one of the approved participating dealers. Does that mean um, prior to approval, we can't we can't start working on deals with customers? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So basically this would be the first step to becoming an approved dealer. So by attending today, you're more than welcome to submit the paperwork. Um, but are you with, I'm sorry, are you with Phoenix Motor Cars? Yeah. Okay. Are you guys local or? Yeah, we're in Ontario. You're in Ontario. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so yeah. You uh, could... Actually, we're in Anaheim now. Sorry, we moved. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, that's still California, so it's okay. Um, so yeah, no, you have to just be in our region because, um, we, you know, we don't allow out-of-state deliveries or, or you know, uh, anybody that's not operating in California because we, basically they have to apply California sales tax and register the vehicle in California. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, thank you. Right. Thank you for your question. Um, and then we have Joe. Did you still have a question, Joe? Go ahead. In order for the uh, customer to apply for the extensions, uh, he has to provide a uh, buyer's order. This buyer's order has to show the uh, amount that he was approved for also deducted from the selling price. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And the uh, next question uh, that uh, you're probably going to answer anyways, um, our dealership is approved already. Not mm -hmm. me as a salesperson. Uh, can you provide me the uh, steps uh, afterwards uh, as to how uh, we need to get uh, our name on the uh, list with the dealership? Sure. Um, because we already have an existing contract with your dealership, um, you can submit applications uh, right after completing the training. So uh, it'll take a few days for us to update our website with the new list of training <clears throat> dealers, but because we already have an existing contract with your dealership, there is no waiting period for you because you know they're just adding a new salesperson, not a, not a new contract. Okay, I still need to fill out a form, is that correct? No. no. Oh, okay. You Great. just, uh, you know, we'll add you and um, you don't even have to wait for the website to be updated. You can start submitting applications tomorrow. Great, thank you, Ash. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay, I don't see any more raised hands, right, Paul? Not, not now. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, we can continue. Okay, um, there's actually, before we go to that slide, Paul, if you don't mind, there was a handout um, that I was gonna ask um, Anthony, I don't know if you can open up. There's an attachment called a All right. truck and bus. Can we switch to that document? I just wanna show yes. that to everybody. Thank truck you. And bus. Says T &A. Carl Moyer here. One, just give me one second. No problem. Perfect. Great. We are. Thank you, sir. Okay, great. So I just want to show you guys, I, this was one of the handouts that was emailed to you when you received the 
uh, confirmation for the workshop. This is a handy tool to have. I would print some of these out and um, hand it to your VIP applicants that come in to apply because it has all the details of what they need to do, um, you know, how, what, what steps do they need to do? And then can we go to page two real quick? Um, yes. Oh, please. Thanks. So I know a lot of them are going to ask you, what happens if I cancel the purchase agreement after I apply? Well, CARB even has information there because, again, we, we don't want to encourage people to just do this on a whim to, to, you know, this is not a get out of jail for free card to buy more time on their old truck and then just change their mind and go buy a used uh, diesel truck later. So it says that, you know, if the owner claims the manufacturer delay extension and then later cancels the original purchase agreement, the claim for the extension will be treated as invalid and the vehicle owner will be out of compliance mm -hmm. as if the agreement was never executed. And the vehicle owner could be subject to enforcement action. So the manufacturer delay extension cannot be claimed if you modify the original purchase agreement after September 1st. Um, so the, you know, uh, I want to highlight that because I wanna make sure that we're communicating the right information to applicants that come in and they understand that, look, you're putting in a, a legitimate binding agreement to buy the vehicle. And this is not, we're not window shopping. So uh, I, that's why I wanted to highlight this document and, and have that in your toolbox when they come in, if they have any questions, please make sure you provide that to them. If they have more questions about this, they can call CARB. Uh, the number is right down there at the bottom. It says, where can I get more information? Um, and they can either call, call them or email them and they'll clarify any other items they need to know. But again, um, I can't reiterate how important it is that everything is done before September 1st. So please make sure they get started sooner than later as opposed to walking in on August 31st. All right, um, thanks, Paul. Can we switch to back to our slides now? Thank you. Great, thank you. Were we on 24 or 25, Ash? Um, what was 24 was the end of the manufacturer extension, right, if I remember? Yes. Okay, so yeah, let's go to 25, thank you. Okay, so a lot of times people ask, well, how do I prove the supplemental documentation that you're asking for? Or what, what satisfies that element? So I want to go over some examples of what we accept. So one of the requirements is you have to currently own and operate the old vehicle. Um, usually, or obviously, we, the, what we need for that is the current DMV title, showing the applicant as the sole owner with no active lien holder. So if they have an active lien holder, that needs to be removed before they apply. Um, for, for, for the voucher. Uh, minimum of two years history of driving the truck. Um, again, uh, usage records, uh, you know, there. I wouldn't recommend, even though it says fuel receipts, fuel receipts are very tough to keep track of. And I, I would recommend mileage logbooks if they have logbooks or, um, you know, their bid inspections. A lot of people use bid inspections or tune-up records. That works the best because again, they do that on a, quarterly basis already. So it, the easiest path would be to provide that and uh, we could use the mileage to calculate their usage. Um, and the usage document must clearly substantiate usage and be linked to the project vehicle. So it can't just be uh, a, a blank sheet of paper that says truck and the odometer. We need to be able to see the details of the truck and see who performed the service. If it's a maintenance record that's done by a, you know, a mechanic or whoever or if it's a bid inspection, see who the inspector you know, is that signed the inspection report and provide all that information so we can link it clearly. Why are we so specific about this? Well, because as you know, or you may not know, we get audited by the California Resources Board on our incentive program. And when they review our projects, they're gonna say, did you validate what we require under this program? And we need to make sure we've clearly demonstrated that we were able to verify the usage based on the documentation provided. So I hope that helps explain it. Um, also, old truck was operated at least 75% of miles in California during each 12 month period for the previous 24 months. Again, as I said earlier, if the records will work for single truck fleets and um, this requirement, if you're, California, if, you're, if you're a California only applicant, 
you don't need to worry about it because by being California only, you're obviously operating all your miles in California. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. Okay. So what are the basic steps in the process for, for those who like flowcharts? Um, so the dealer inspects the applicant's existing vehicle and documentation to determine eligibility. If eligible, dealer assists the application to complete the application and um, the dealer gathers everything and submits the completed application to South Coast AQMD. Uh, South Coast AQMD approves or rejects it within 15 business days. If it's rejected, the applicant gets a letter and they can resubmit if it's something that they can remedy. Um, like they didn't have something that they couldn't provide within those 15 days that we have to evaluate. If it's something that they're not eligible for, or like, you know, if they're a large fleet or they have outstanding citations, again, it all depends on what the reason for rejection is. But if it's something that's easily resolved, I, I usually do my best to reach out to the dealer to resolve it within those 15 days so we don't have to restart the process. But if it doesn't, then we have to reject it and they would have to remedy that before we can accept another application for that applicant for the specific truck. Um, but once they get approved, the dealer gets the voucher package initiating the award. The applicant would sign the purchase order invoice and dealer gets the vehicle ready. Applicant turns in the old truck and picks up the new one and signs the receipt of voucher. Uh, the dealer contacts authorized dismounter for pickup of the old truck and the dealer compiles a reimbursement package and sends it to us. Um, and South Coast, it can be approved the reimbursement package and issues payment to the dealer. Um, so, so it's not too difficult of a process. Basically, you know, you submit the application, we evaluate it once it's approved, you get a package with a checklist of items to, to submit. And, um, you know, it's, it's a straightforward process once, once you get a hang of it for, you know, doing two or three of them. And we're always here to help if you need to have any questions. Um, next slide. All right, so what inspections are required by the dealer? The, the, at the time of application, when you submit the first ap initial application, you need to do the pre-inspection. So it's basically um, when, you, when you look at the uh, package or the application form, the last three pages are the inspection form and what you need to do is inspect the old truck and take specific uh, photos and um, basically you document the information about the engine about the vehicle and all the information for the old truck and you submit that with the application for the pre-inspection now there's also something called the pre-dismantle inspection this is after the project's been approved and you're getting ready to deliver the old truck to the dismantler so what you do is this, and this will be part of your approval package that you get. So we send you a, a dealer reimbursement package, which will include another inspection form that will look identical to the pre-inspection, except it's checked off the pre-dismantle as opposed to the inspection pre-inspection. And what the pre-dismantle is, is basically saying, look, here's the truck as it looks now, and I've confirmed that it looks just like it did uh, as when we did the pre-inspection, is to show basically that nothing has been uh, Take, you know, uh, what is it? You, you haven't done any substantial cha cha changes since the initial pre inspection. However, again, if the truck is being towed into you or if it's been stripped of parts, uh, that's not allowed and you must reject it and make sure that, um, you know, everything is in the same condition and the vehicle's uh, operational when they bring it to you. And uh, at that point, the title would be signed off and, and given to the dealer so that the dealer can surrender the truck to the dismount. Um, for the new truck, there's something called the post inspection. Again, same form, uh, same requirements, except this time it's details about the new truck. So the dealership confirms the program funded truck to be awarded as correct vehicle and meets all the program requirements, and you conduct the inspection for that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so submittal of complete application packages are essential. Um, I can't reiterate that enough. So please, I know this is this is one of those programs where there's a lot of upfront work, but once you've done it and you get the hang of it, then it becomes um, pretty straightforward. And uh, the the back end is is very very easy, and there isn't much work afterwards. So it's just a lot of upfront work to get the package submitted, and then once it's approved, then it's pretty uh, pretty easy process from then on. So you want to make sure you know. You have the copy of the old vehicle title. 
uh, vehicle usage documentation for the previous 24 months. Make sure it's legible and it has the details we mentioned. Copy of the DMV registration for the previous 24 months or the eight month option if they want to exercise that. Uh, copies of the insurance cards for the previous 24 months with the VIN. Um, so if they have insurance card that just says fleet, uh, we would need something more than that. It can't just say entire fleet. We want an actual VIN referenced in the insurance so we know that specific vehicle is in the insurance records. Uh, inspection form signed by the dealer. Digital photos, make sure it's uh, clear enough that the resolution is, is legible when we review it. Uh, verification of the old engine model year. Uh, sign quote and spec sheet for the replacement truck. And copy of the CARB executive order for the replacement engine. Um, I'm sure everybody, most of you should know what a CARB executive order is. It's basically the certification for that specific engine that CARB has certified for operation in California. If you're not familiar with it or need to know where to find those, um, I, can, I can send that to you. But basically, it's the document that says CARB has uh, certified this truck or this engine for operation in California. Um, and I, like I said earlier, if you have a truck that is going to be a 2024 model year with a 2023 engine and it has yet to be certified, you can provide a copy of the 2022 equivalent and um, say that specifying the application, the applicant will be pursuing the 2023 equivalent engine with the you know, engine family number once it becomes certified. I see some questions. Um, let's see here. Paul, do you see them as well? June Mendez and Joseph Vital. Okay, we'll start with June. Hi, June. Go ahead and hit uh, star six, June. Can we not? There you go. Yep. Hi, June. Yeah, I think on slide 26, uh, Ash, you said that uh, the truck should be picked up by the dismantler mm -hmm. uh, on the dealer, uh, at the dealership. It's an option. It, I mean, it's either delivered by the dealer or picked up by the dismantler. It's either or. Oh, okay. And I thought it was supposed to be delivered to the dismantler. It's an yeah. like, That they're working. Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, in the past, what we've seen is some dealers deliver the truck to the dismaller, others arrange for the dismaller to, to pick it up. But either way, they need to verify that's operational before they accept it. We just don't want the applicant being the one delivering the driving the truck to the dismaller. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Sure, no, thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, and then, Joe? Joseph, go ahead. So, Ash, on the... Um... Spec sheet for the uh, engines, um, for example, we sell Freightliner, and if um, <clears throat> I try to input that on the uh, buyer's order or the uh, invoice, uh, the quote, it's going to be uh, quite big. So basically, if I, if I just, for example, here's the buyer's order, uh, 2024 Freightliner, it specifies the uh, engine, uh, Cummins, ISX, 12 n CNG, that's all you need. You don't actually need like 17 pages from Freightliner, do you? No, um, okay. I mean, that we'll need the spec sheet as part of the application, but on the buyer's order, uh, we don't need that. You can just say, like you said, um, 2024 uh, Freightliner with uh, Cummins ISX 12. And, and okay. um, I would even put in, well, if it's, it's gonna, it'd be a 2023 engine, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so you can put engine family to be determined, TBD. So that okay. um, because it's not available yet, and once it does, then we could update that. But okay, I just didn't want to send you thirty pages of information that you don't need. Well, again, um, you want to make sure that's part of the application package because we'll need that as the spec sheet. The spec sheet is required as part of the application, but we don't need all that details on the quote. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Thanks again. No problem. Good question. Um, okay, I don't see any others, so. We can continue. All right, uh, we can go to the next slide, Paul. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but incomplete packages will not be accepted. So please make sure you review the checklists, uh, make sure the application is signed and complete and there are no gaps in vehicle ownership or usage and all required documentation is included, including the inspection documentation, clear digital photographs of the old vehicle, and uh, especially for the first attempt, please uh, feel free to call me or email me. Um, I'd even be happy to host a Zoom, a private Zoom meeting if you wanna show me your stuff before you submit it. Because once you submit it, that starts the time clock for us and that we have 15 days to evaluate. So I'd rather go over a, a sample one with you if you like, just to see what you've covered because um, there's a lot of details as you can see. And, it always helps to just go over it and make sure we understand what, what our intent is of what we're asking for and to help uh, reduce the number of back and forth we need during the evaluation process. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, at this point, I wanna go over the, the actual VIP application. Um, and Paul, I believe that's just titled 2022 VIP application, on the PDF file, if you don't mind opening that up when you have a moment. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Paul. Okay, so this is the VIP app. When you go to our website, you know, you can download this and it is fillable. Like you can fill out the fields, type it in if you like. Um, that way you don't have to handwrite it, but you're more than welcome to do that as well, as long as it's legible. Um, so this is the first two pages of the application are just, again, reminder of what we need in the application. So says, you know, please make sure you print clearly, um, submit all the supporting documentation and complete one application for each truck. So if they wanna apply for like three, you're gonna be submitting three separate applications. Um, and it goes over the bulleted items of what's required. Can we go to page two, please, Paul? Okay, so this is more details of what we've discussed. Again, it says right there, you know, we need the title, the registration, we need to verify 24 months of ownership, usage records, insurance. There's some military service provision if someone has that. Um, applying for funds, the applicant may apply through the voucher incentive program, um, but they cannot combine funds with other state programs. Um, there's a 241 vehicle option. We've never had anyone apply for that, but it is an option. And what that is, is basically they, their existing truck, the mileage is so low that they can't get enough funding using the mileage from the first truck. So they say, okay, I'm gonna turn in two trucks, combine the mileage and apply that towards a one new replacement truck. Um, it only makes sense if, if you really can live with going down to two, one truck from two trucks. But again, it's an option, but we have yet to see anyone apply for it. Uh, let's go to the next page of the slide. Okay, so this is the actual beginning of the application. Uh, you want to, as you can see, it, it is fillable. That's why the fields are blue. So you can type in the information. Um, please make sure that you provide all the details in there specifically. Um, we want to make sure the applicant provides an email address. Why? Because we've gone paperless. And when we send out the approval or rejection, we send everything by email. So we can't log in the application if the applicant doesn't provide an email address. And uh, this again is a checklist of the items mentioned on the first two pages. Uh, we can go to the next page of the document. Okay, and then this is the first full page of the application, applicant information. Third party, we don't have anybody to fill out. The dealers don't need to fill out the third party. This is only if there was like a consultant or something, but dealers are not, are not considered third party. So you don't need to fill out the third party. Um, as you see at the bottom of this page, page four, it's asking for the existing vehicle information. So please make sure you provide all the details, the make, model, um, VIN, license plate, manufacture date, all those details. 
Um, now, if they don't have a DOT number, just put NA, not available. Uh, CHP number, if they don't know what that is, that's their CA number. Um, they usually have that, so they need to provide that. Fleet ID is basically, did they assign a unique number to their truck? If they did, great. If not, you can leave that blank. Um, but all the other details, um, like the engine information, make, model, model year, uh, manufacture date, serial number, engine family number, and horsepower, make sure all those are available. Um, of course, the engine should be operational, so you check that yes at the bottom. And the fuel, most likely diesel, but other options are available for the old truck, so you check the appropriate box. Uh, let's go to the page five of this application, please. Thank you. Now, um, because these are all 2007 to 2009 engine model years, uh, we would not need any retrofit information because they were already these technology these engines were already equipped with the technology, so there's no retrofit information required. So you can leave that section blank. Now, this other section in the middle, the replacement vehicle and engine information. This is very critical. You want to make sure it's filled out correctly. Um, and again, I realize a lot of the information, like the VIN, the odometer reading, um, you know, the delivery date, and the, those details have are yet to be determined. So you can just put in the words, the letters TBD for things that are not available. However, we do need to know the make, the model, the model year for the truck. Um, we do need to also know what GVWR you're going to build it at. That's usually, at, you know, it's available when you spec it out. Um, we also need to know, will you be getting uh, natural gas, uh, low NOx, or zero emission? Um, with the engine, we need the make and model and model year. And obviously, my manufacture date will be to be determined, and the serial number will be to be determined. But we do need the engine family number. That's you get that number from the executive order, the CARB executive order that I was talking about earlier. And that's always available. And again, if the executive order has yet to be developed or certified, you can use the 2022 ex equivalent and just say, uh, you know, we'll provide 2023 equivalent once it becomes available. Um, Everything else is the same as the existing vehicle, except you're providing the information for the new truck. So yes, the engine will be operational. The fuel use, it, it would need to be CNG or zero emission or you know the drivetrain, drivetrain, and the corresponding CARB executive order number. And the bottom, just provide your um, information as a dealership. Uh, next page, please. Okay, this part is is pretty straightforward. All, all fleets that apply are going to be reporting in truckers or the DTR. So you would check up, check the first box in there uh, because we don't have any NOx exempt regions down here. And what they want to know is the operational area for the existing truck. So basically, we need to have the existing truck operating through our region. So at least 25% of their operation should be down in South Coast, which is what we are. Uh, it's not a lot of people read this and they immediately put South Central Coast, which is not us. That's actually um, ab above us or further north from us. So that would be like Ventura County or Santa Barbara County. So make sure that at least 25% of their operation is in our region, which is South Coast. And then, uh, you know, most people are 100% or 90% in South Coast. And if they're in any of these other regions, please specify the percentage. And as a rule of thumb, of course, please make sure they all add up to be 100%. Uh, next page, please. OK, so this page it doesn't seem like it's important, but this is actually one of the most important pages because you want to make sure the applicant reads all of these bullets and they understand what they're applying for. Um, because they are signing a legal uh, agreement with, with AQMD and CARB when they sign this. So you want to make sure they understand all of these elements and Please make sure they sign it, date it, print their name and title, whether it's president, owner, or whatever it is. And then let's go to the next page. So those first seven pages were the application. Um, as I mentioned, every application has to come with a pre-inspection. So this is the standards inspection form. And as you can see, uh, whether, whether it's a pre-inspection, pre-dismantle inspection, dis dismantle inspection, or the post-inspection for the new truck, it's all the same form. It just depends on where we are in the stage of the process. So when you submit the application, you're going to be submitting the pre-inspection, which is you know the first box in the first row that you see up there under the existing vehicle. Uh, you provide all the details and the information about the existing vehicle. It's going to feel like you're filling out the application again, but it's basically for the inspection form. So you provide all those details. Um, let's go to the next page, please. 
Okay, and uh, for the top part that says for pre-dismantle inspection only, you don't need to fill that part up for the pre-inspection because we're not at that stage yet. You're just submitting the application. So you can leave that portion blank. You could also leave the dismantle inspection portion blank. If there's any comments like, you know, um, applicant, if the applicant is gonna keep the, the box, if they have like a you know, box truck and they wanna transfer the box over to their new truck, that's, that's allowed, that's, that's not a problem. So you can put in a comment, Am applicant will transfer box over to new truck or, you know, some unique scenario that you wanna point out, you can point that out. Um, and then you wanna make sure you're the one, the dealer rep is signing this at the bottom and dating it. The date that you sign it, please make sure it's the date that you conducted the inspection. So um, that's very important that we need to have that date because it will certify, you know, you're signing that I did the inspection, everything's accurate and correct, and the pictures are depicting what I saw. So we want to make sure that's cor correctly reflected. Uh, let's go to the last page. Okay, so I mentioned how every inspection has different photos that's required, and this is just a checklist of what photos are required. As you can see, the, the, the biggest number or highest number of photos is under the pre-inspection because this is the starting point. So you need to take pictures from the left side, right side, front of the truck with the license plate showing clearly, vehicle from the back, the VIN, the GVWR rating, uh, odometer reading, and then the engine tag showing those four elements. And then their DOT or CHP number, most likely they have a CA number. And then don't worry about retrofit device because it won't apply anymore. But um, you are welcome to like a lot of times people will take a photo that shows both the VIN and the GVWR in one photo. That's totally fine. I don't need to have a separate photo for each element. But we don't want to combine too many things because like if it's the left and right side, they need to be two different distinct photos, obviously. And um, the engine tag, you can try to get everything, depending on the engine manufacturer, you might be able to get all four of those elements that make, model, serial number, and panel number all in one shot. If not, it doesn't hurt to add in, you know, throw in a second photo from the left or right, because these labels can be pretty long. Um, and uh, sometimes one part, you know, has the serial, the other side has the family number, so that's totally fine. Now, again, this checklist, as you see, um, has it for the pre-inspection the pre-dismantle inspection, which is of the basically re-inspecting the existing truck that's gonna be scrapped, but you, you, you only need to do a lot less photos for that. And that's later in the process after it's been approved. So for the purpose of filling out the application and submitting it uh, initially, all you need to focus, focus on is the pre-inspection of the existing vehicle. Uh, any questions about this? Okay, I see some hands raised. We have Castillo A. Okay. Hello. You need to unmute yourself. Star six. Castillo, are you there? Okay, do we have, maybe we can go back to Castillo. Is there another question, someone else? Joseph? Yeah, me again, Ash. It's okay. <laughs> so um, a lot of these uh, port drivers, uh, drayage drivers um, uh, don't speak English very well. Any chance the uh, VIP application uh, comes in Spanish? Um. That's a good question. We, we, we haven't had that before, but a lot of time, I mean, again, we're relying on the dealers to help them out with it. And okay. so uh, if you, you know, don't, you know, one of the things that we need, uh, and that's why they're coming to you. So, if, but if you need help with, uh, you know, someone to, I don't want to assume that you speak Spanish. So, so if, if you need someone to help with um, Spanish speaker, we do have staff that can help translate for them. If they have questions that, needs clarification or, you know, uh, we'd be happy to help them out with that. I do speak Spanish, but um, nonetheless, I, I think I, I just make it a little bit easier, but we can work with the uh, English. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Castillo, did you want to ask a question? 
You're still muted, so do star six, please. No? Okay, we can come back to uh, Castillo, uh, okay. hopefully. Oh, wait. No, okay, I thought that was, that's fine. Yeah, let's move on and then we'll come back later. Back to the PowerPoint now? Yes, please. Thank you, Paul. Okay. And we can go to the next uh, slide. Thank you. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, in previous years, we call this the, or as of 2020, we call this COVID measures, but we're just calling it safety measures because of us going uh, paperless for the process that we're doing for the VIP program. Um, we, we need you to complete the VIP pa package, including all the supporting documentation and completed pre-inspection forms and photos and scan them into one PDF document. Please make sure you're scanning it in color, especially for the photos, because uh, we need to be able to see things clearly. Um, the file must be no more than 20 megabytes. So um, you can either use a lower resolution scan if, if the file is too big or create a zip file, which compresses the size by 60%. So all documents provided must be clear and legible. Uh, and what you would do is once you have everything uh, completed and ready, you scan everything into a PDF document and you would email it. We have a program email that we've developed. It's VIP underscore program at aqmd.gov. So um, you would just submit your uh, PDF document that's scanned to that email address. And you want to enter the words VIP application uh, followed by the applicant name in the email. So for example, VIP application dash John Smith. And if you're submitting more than one VIP application, please separate a, submit a separate email for each application. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna go over the elements of after the voucher has been approved and what's included in there, just to give you an idea of that. And, and uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions afterwards. So the approved vo voucher package, um, once you're approved, the dealer will receive the following documents to complete and submit with the reimbursement package. Um, it's, there's a document called the voucher itself, which is basically the formal approval. There's a receipt of voucher. There's a reimbursement invoice. Uh, there's an inspection form, like I said, which will include the pre-inspection, post-inspection, and pre-dismantle inspection. And the reimbursement package checklist. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so dealer reimbursement packages submitted to South Coast AQMD must include the following original documents. The, ori the original voucher, which we will email to you. So make sure you print it out and, and have the applicant sign it. There's a page that they have to sign or section that they need to sign and accept the voucher. Uh, the receipt of voucher um, that needs to be signed as well by the program participant. And then the reimbursement invoice, which needs to be signed by the dealership. The reimbursement invoice, there's a section on it that asks for the federal tax ID number. Please make sure that's the federal tax ID number for the dealership, not for the applicant, because it's the dealer that's going to be getting the check and it's going to be paid to the dealership. Um, so I just want to highlight that. Next slide, please. Okay. So talk about additional details that's required. So you must include a copy of the following documents. DMV registration showing the vehicle registered to the participant in California. Now, um, I do wanna point out about this because it's kind of like, uh, you know, putting the cart before the horse or, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. So I realize that you can't provide a copy of the new truck DMV registration until the truck's been delivered and paid for in full. So in lieu of providing the DMV registration, which we know it happens after the fact that the, the vehicle has been delivered, ARB or California Air Resources Board has allowed us to um, use three documents that you can provide that shows that it will be registered. One of them is called the DMV Form 343, which is the DMV application for new registration. It's a two page document. You wanna make sure all the sections are filled out and, and signed on page two by the applicant and, you, and you get, the dealer fills out all the details for all the sections. I believe it's sections one through nine. And uh, the other document we need is a DMV form reg 4008. It's a form that's called, um, it's a declaration of the GVWR for the new truck. So basically 
the applicant is certifying that they will register a truck in that GVWR range. And then the third item you need is a copy of the old truck title um, signed off and dated in the section where they release it in the, in the middle section of the title. So those three items uh, per car constitute satisfying this DMV registration requirement because they, to them, they see this as, okay, this shows proof that the applicant will, uh, of course, register the truck in California uh, by providing these documents and information. Um, secondly, you need to provide financing documentation. Now for 2022, one thing that CARB's added is the financing documentation must be signed by the applicant. So as opposed to just being an approval letter from a lender or something like that as before, we need an actual purchase agreement that shows that the applicant has signed and agreed to receiving those, those funds. And so you wanna make sure you provide that with the applicant's signature if they're financing. If they're paying cash or they're not getting any financing for the outstanding balance, they would just need to provide um, how they're paying for the outstanding balance. If they're paying, you know, if they're paying cash, then we need a copy of a cashier's check or a proof of a bank wire transfer showing that wire transfer has been uh, completed. Um, and those would be the methods that you need to provide if you're paying cash, whether a cashier's check or wire transfer. And then the final invoice from the dealer showing the final purchase price which should be the same as the, well, it should be in, in the same range as the, as the initial quote, unless there's something was added, but um, the final purchase price minus the voucher amount that they're getting. And uh, this final purchase order must be signed and dated by the applicant. Uh, we also need to see the replacement vehicle warranty, which covers at least one year, 100,000 mile major engine components, including parts and labor. And the title of the old vehicle signed and dated by the applicant, which I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so you must also include the following additional information and forms, and all of these will be provided to you in the package. So it's a matter of just filling it out and submitting it when you submit the reimbursement package. Um, so we need the inspection forms, which is called Appendix I. It will be sent to you when the approval is sent out. And we need digital photos of the old and replacement vehicle. So you'd be doing the pre-dismantle inspection, which is the re-inspection of the old truck and the post-inspection of the new truck. We need the location of the designated participating dismantler and where the old vehicle will be destroyed. You will provide that information in the pre-dismantle inspection form. Remember there was a section on the form. Um, actually, can we open up the um, AQMD application again real quick, Paul? Sorry, I'd like to point that out so people know. Was that the last PDF we were on or the one prior? The last one, yeah, the most. The, 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 okay. The seven pager one or the 10 pager. Okay. Thank you. What, what page? Um, let's go two more pages or one page back, please. There we go. Okay. So I just want to point out on this inspection form when we do the pre dismantle inspection. As you see in the top, it says for pre-dismantle inspection only. So that's where you'd provide which dismantler you're taking the truck to, uh, who the point of contact is, their phone number, and that the DMV title uh, delivered and signed by the owner. You want to check yes, and obviously the engine needs to be operational. Um, you can also, in, the, in addition to providing that, you can put in additional info in the comment, sec comment section, whether delivered, uh, we'll be delivering truck to this dismantler mentioned above on this date, or will be picked up by dismantler on this date. But we need to have that detailed information with the reimbursement package so we know which dismantler it's going to. Um, okay, Paul, thank you for showing me. We can go back to the slides. Great, thank you. Oh, uh, can we stay back on that one? Sorry, or well, yeah, okay. So yeah, so basically, you 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 would designate uh, which dismantler you're using, and you want to make sure it's one of the approved VIP dismantlers, uh, because we have dismantlers under our other incentive programs like Prop One B. So you want to make sure you're going to the VIP participating dismantlers that's listed on our website, and that. Um, 
you specify the date the old vehicle is delivered or picked up by the dismantling. Um, now we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so just like the application process, we're still doing the paperless for the dealer reimbursement package. This is after the project's been approved and you're ready to deliver the new truck and, and you're, you're ready to submit that to us for reimbursement. So you'd complete the deal, dealer reimbursement package, including all the supporting documentation and completed pre-dismantle and post-inspection forms and photos and scan it into one PDF document again same size restrictions and suggestions of how to submit it. And you would email it to the same email address, VIP underscore program at aqmd.gov. Except this time in the subject line, you just put the VIP project number and you'll know that because when we send out the approval, there'll be a VIP project number that's assigned to it. So you'd write VIP number, whatever number it is, as a hyphen and then DRP for a dealer reimbursement package. So if you have multiple dealer reimbursement packages to submit, please send a separate email for each one. And um, once it's submitted and we are processing the, the reimbursement package, uh, the dealers need to submit something that's on our website called the VIP dealer certification form. And what that is, is proof that you have completed or you've delivered or that this miler has picked up the old truck from you and the date you, you sign that form and the dismantler signs that form. And we need that form uh, either before or while we're waiting for the check to be issued. Um, so we can coordinate that. And we've been pretty flexible in terms of working with the dealers to do that. Historically, we'd have you come and pick up the check in person and we'd ask you to bring that on the day you come to pick up the check. But now because we've gone remote and everything is uh, sent out um, automatically, once the check is issued, uh, we ask that you send that to us, you know, within no more than, you know, 10 business days of when you receive the check. And it's proof that basically the or the old truck has been surrendered to you and it's been delivered to the dismantler. And um, that basically closes the whole loop of the cycle showing that, yeah, the truck's already at the dismantler and it's going to be dismantled within the next 60 days. Any questions about that? And in case anyone's wondering where that form is, it would be on our website as well, the same page as the you know VIP program workshop or VIP program website. And it's the form is called VIP dealer certification form. Okay. Is Castillo's name a hand up again or is that still from before? I, I don't remember. Or maybe he never took it down, no? Okay, we Castillo, are you? Do you have questions? No, I don't hear anything. Okay, I've, which, I've, I've tried to unmute him again, uh, Ash. He might have an older version of Zoom. That's why he can't. You know. Okay, no worries. Yeah, and Castillo, feel free to email me your question after the workshop, and I'll I'll be happy to answer you. Uh, we can continue. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, we can go to the next slide. Yep. Okay, so that completes the dealership training, um, but please uh, stay on if you can. The dismount training is relatively quick and, and I wanna finish with questions at the end with everybody as well. So let's get started to the next slide for the dismantler training. Okay, there's like three clicks that you need to do to show all the bullets. So go ahead and do that, three or four, let's see, one more. Perfect, thank you. So uh, as a reminder, I mentioned this at the introduction, but uh, the qualifications for participating dealers, you must be a licensed dismantler by the DMV. You have to have a California business license for the last two years and a current Cal EPA hazardous materials generators permit. And you must be in compliance with all local, state and federal, federal laws and regulations. Next slide, please. And go ahead and click this like four times too, I think we're five. Yeah, there we go, and one more. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so dismantlers play a very critical role because as I said, they're like the final step in the whole process to make sure we're getting the air quality benefits that's required under this program by making sure that the old truck has been permanently removed from operation. So within 60 days of receipt, the dismantler must um, cut or both frame rails must be completely severed between the front and rear axles. They must puncture an engine block, a minimum of three inch hole irregularly shaped. 
and the section of the oil pan flange must be removed as part of the hole or have a line cut through it that connects to the hole. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Perfect, thank you. So dismantler documentation. So uh, dismantler must notify South Coast HMB that the vehicle has been destroyed and is ready for inspection and provide documentation to South Coast HMB that the old vehicle is registered with the DMV as a non-repairable L10 transaction code or C26, if that's an option, uh, or and provide copies of this file notice to South Coast HMB at the time of the post dismantle inspection. And you must provide verification to South Coast HMB and from the DMV that the vehicle has been registered as non-repairable within 90 days of the dismantle inspection. Usually what you dismantlers do is provide a form called the DMV reconciliation report, which shows that the L10 uh, uh, document, the vehicle has been registered as L10 in, with the DMV, which means it's non-revivable and uh, you know they can't be re-registered. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in line with our other safety measures that we've implemented over the past two years, you know, um, VIP dismantlers will need to conduct the post dismantle inspection outlined in the VIP guidelines by filling out the inspection form and taking the required photos. And then the South Coast AKMB inspectors will contact the dismantler to provide the inspection instructions and required paperwork. Dismantlers will need to make sure the post dismantle inspection has been reviewed and approved by the South Coast AQMD inspector before removing the truck from your facility. So once you receive the truck and you're ready to conduct the inspection, you just reach out to, to us and say, you know, I have a truck that needs to be inspected. And the inspector that's assigned will reach out to you and provide you the paperwork and instructions, and they will do a, a, a live Zoom inspection with you. Um, and, uh, until we eventually go back into the office and have an in-person option at that point. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, that ends the uh, training for the dismantler training requirement. Although it's uh, the, it may seem extremely lopsided in terms of number of slides, I wanna point out dismantlers pl play a very critical role in this program. So uh, I do appreciate all of you participating that you know are involved in the program. Um, let's go to the next slide, which will be our last slide. Um, at this point, this is my contact information. And again, the VIP application submittal uh, goes through that email address, the VIP underscore program at aqmd.gov. I know it's been a lengthy workshop, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have at this point. Or if you like, you're welcome to email me or call me later. Um, but I did want to open it up for a few minutes of questions if anybody has any questions at this point. Going once, going twice, anybody left? <laughs> we just have Castillo still. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, my slides were brutally clear. That's why I'm just joking. Um, okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending. And again, as mentioned, by by, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me by email, by by phone. And um, if you are a part of a dealer or dismantler that already has a uh, contract with us, then you're more than welcome to start participating after this training. And if you're a new dealer or dismantler that wants to enter into a contract with South Coast KQMB please uh, send me an email uh, say, uh, providing the required elements that we asked for, and we will initiate the contract process and we'll go from there. Um, so thank everybody for attending and I wish you have a wonderful rest of your day.